Oh, Lucas, aside from doing interviews where you answer the same questions over and over and over and over again, how's your day going so far? It's good. Yeah, today is the first day of answering the same questions over and over again for the whole campaign. So I'm a little bit, uh, bright, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed at the moment. But a couple of months time, I'll be fucking sick of it. <laughs> I can imagine. But we're here first and foremost to plug the noble art of self-destruction, which you recorded in Canada. I believe over a month or so spent in Canada. When did you uh, f actually finish the record? Yeah, so we started recording the album. Uh, a big, uh, an important part of this album was the fact that we wanted to kind of record it somewhere that didn't feel like home to us, almost to see if we could try and find any extra magic, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And basically we, we just finished the tour with Silverstein and the Amity Affliction. And we stayed out in America, went up to Toronto and we recorded there for, a month at the, I think it was just, at, it was like at the end of October through to the end of November. So we got home and just in time for December. So yeah. Got it. Difficult album to make. I asked that because I know it's the third part of a trilogy. So there were expectations for it to be great and keep up with the concept. Yeah, you're right. This was definitely the first album where I felt like pressure because yeah, like our first album did really well, but it was very much like, loved by our fans whereas i think the greatest mistake was like very much loved by a lot of new people you know so this time you know i feel like we're we're actually trying to live up to something um and you know writing uh, recording an album there's always i think a big part of my creative process is the fact that i've got a devil on my shoulder who tells me i suck every time i do something so i think it, it's a good way of hard proofing everything i create because by the time people have heard it, I've already told myself it sucks five times. And the sixth time I finally said, no, actually, I think it's good, you know? So yeah, I think, I think we managed to prevail. But yeah, you did hit um, the nail on the head there with the fact that this was a little bit of a different and far more scary process than we've ever had before, yeah. So you just mentioned how self-deprecating you can be. The title, The Noble Art of Self-Destruction, sounds like all that comes from you, that you came up with that title. Yeah, very much so, yeah. This, this album was, was about, you know, um, yeah, essentially, like you said, it's not so much about being self-critical as it's about, you know, I guess embracing all the things you have been through and whether those things are self-inflicted or not. Actually, that, you, you raised a good point there, you know. This album is about going through hardship and recovering, but I guess, I put a lot of hardship on myself and I feel like my work is better for it actually. So, so yeah, you're right. But uh, yeah, the, the self-deprecating dude did come up with the self-deprecating album title. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, can you take a compliment or two or no, we can't do that. I can smile and nod my head. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, you have a very difficult job because you're expected to sound a certain way, which takes a lot of work and takes a lot of practice to not blow your voice out from doing that, but at the same time have to look cool, but at the same time you have to have stage presence. It's not like you just learn the song and that's that. You know, you also have to dodge fists and flying objects and all that. You know, being in a post-hardcore band, there's a lot of energy and a lot you have to pay attention to. So what's your warm-up routine like before a show, knowing you have to sound cool, look cool, not blow your voice out, be alert, etc. Yeah, dude. I mean, that's a great question because, yeah, I, I think, you know, the I'm not you know, the natural born rock and roller, you know, like I'm here because I love making music and, and I, I love, you know, writing, uh, creating things basically, you know, but yeah, there are definitely some musicians that fall out of bed looking cooler than I do when I make a real vested effort. But yeah, I think, you know, I, I'd say I, I take, real care of my voice on the road i'm very boring and sensible i don't drink alcohol i eat four hours before we play i warm up and do loads of stuff so that is definitely a boring thing that i have to go through a lot of um and then the other thing i guess i do a lot of stretching before we go on stage because uh you know to anybody who's seen us live before i i have um something of a trademark high kick <laughs> which sounds so so geeky when you say it but no. i uh one of one of my moves is uh, i do a big kick in the air with the music and uh, and i've pulled muscles doing it before <laughs> so there's definitely you know highs and lows to it all you know yeah i actually did want to ask you about that with the high kick the first artist 
kicks, and I'm super aware of, but doing the high kicks is David Lee Roth, who from Van Halen, who winds up in every yeah. single interview that I do. And he's still doing the high kick when he performs to this day. Now, what was your influence to be able to know that you could do something acrobatic live? Genuinely, it sounds really stupid, but when I was a child, my first passion was football or soccer. So yeah. I, got, I got scouted for a local team. And when I was a kid, that was what I wanted to be for the rest of my life as a football player. You know, and I know most kids want to be footballers, but sure. I guess most people, most musician, m- music fans want to be musicians. So, you know, I was fortunate I got to pursue one of my dreams. But yeah, I've always been very in touch with my calf muscles, I guess. So I think that's probably the natural, it naturally became that, yeah. A huge overlap between football slash soccer and music. And I remember they they settled the Blur Oasis feud with the charity soccer game. And yeah. Rod Stewart, he was supposed to be a footballer. And Robbie Williams has a secret footballer game at his L.A. home all the time, which the singer Weezer is at, et cetera. Nice, I don't know. Do you have a secret football, like, sect of post-punk people that you hang out with? We do actually have like a couple of mini group chats and stuff, you know, I'm quite, like I said, I'm a, I'm a geek, right? So something as, you know, uh, normal and cool as, as football needs to find a geeky kind of connection yeah. somehow. So fantasy football is, is my thing. So I'm in a, a little fantasy football group with a load of people and stuff. But uh, what was the thing I was, I was watching a, um, a mini YouTube documentary the other day about how Seven Nation Army by White Stripes became a football chant in yeah. Belgium in 2008 or something. And now all these years later, it's like kind of become almost like, you know, a, a nursery rhyme rather than the song. It's like, it, yeah. it, you know, transcended pop music, I guess. So uh, that was interesting. But yeah, you're right. It's funny how, I guess, finding how your hobbies will interweave with other hobbies, I suppose. So is it one of those bucket list things where you're holding, you're hoping that holding absence gets to record a football theme for a local team because nowadays everybody gets to do it like yeah dude while did a dallas stars theme it's it's no way i didn't know that yeah Yeah. that's cool man i think it's tough because i think there's a certain energy that uh, where the overlap is you know between football and music i think it almost isn't actually that cool if that makes sense like football music can kind of be a bit lame i think so i don't know if we'd be able to find a way of, of doing it cool um but i will say where i'm from in the united kingdom which is the country wales uh mm-hmm. we love rugby rugby is the big sport here because it's the only thing we're internationally good at and um somebody sent me a photo uh, somebody sent me a video a few months ago of a try getting scored in the millennium stadium in cardiff by wales and our song afterlife was playing in the background so we've got a Holden Absence fan on the PA somewhere in, in the Millennium Stadium, which is cool. That's yeah. fantastic. And Wales, I would say, hey, maybe not a lot of sports exports, but pop star exports. Are you kidding me? Acting yep. exports. Uh, your own language that you could speak around other people that no one else will understand. I think it's meant the perks of being Welsh. Yeah, dude. The, the, the cons. Thank you for saying that because yeah, I I'm I'm incredibly proud of being Welsh. I actually got a Welsh language tattoo on my chest the other day to to be like because it says Ambith, which means forever. So I'm very proud of of my heritage. But it's funny because you know I always say this, but you know the stereotype of an Englishman or a Scotsman or an Irishman, everybody knows those stereotypes. Nobody knows the stereotype of a Welsh outside of the UK. You know, so uh, thank you for you know. Um, you know, celebrating Wales with me a little bit there because, yes, yeah, it's, it's, um, more than often than not, I do just say we're from the United Kingdom because I do think most people wouldn't understand. <laughs> but I guess to, to the point you made as well, you know, lots of famous musicians and actors and, you know, w- Wales is a country of passion, you know, it's a working class country of passion. And I think that is definitely something to do with the, the, the healthy success rate of, of Welsh people, I, I guess. Well, two quick questions and then I'll let you go. And hopefully there are not too many questions brought up in the other interviews. But the first question is, what was the heavy band that got you into the kind of music that you do? Because most people just start off listening to the radio or watching MTV, that kind of a thing. So there's kind of two answers to this. I mean, you know how it is. There's varying degrees of 
yeah. alt music as well, right? But I would say uh, the first, the first one would be Slipknot, where when they released the All Hope Is Gone album. I mm-hmm. remember I was in W. H. Smith, which is a, a bookshop in in the United Kingdom, uh, with my nan, and the, they were on the front cover, and it was. I just remember thinking, dude, that is so cool. And I bought the magazine and I read, I read all about them before I'd even listened to them. And then I remember thinking to myself, oh, I hope I like them, <laughs> you know, because I, this is cool, you know? And yeah, I managed to check it out and I ended up buying All Hope Is Gone on CD and I fell in love with that and worked my way backwards. The other one I want to give a shout out to though is uh, a band called Gallows. And oh, they're yeah. from the United Kingdom. Yeah. And they're kind of like punk I guess it's, they're hard to define really but I've got a gallows tattoo I, I they're one of my favorite bands and and the reason I was introduced to them was in 2006 2007 Guitar Hero I think it was Guitar Hero 4 perhaps or maybe Guitar Hero 3 I don't know but one of the bonus songs was their track in the belly of a shark and I just remember being completely like just blown away by how cool it was you know and I, I bought the CD as soon as I could. And, and I look back and those lyrics are definitely not intended for an 11 year old boy, but um, I'm great. I'm grateful all the, all the same. So, yeah. What lyrics are Beatles lyrics were generally not. Let's say yeah. ones were. No. I will say though, Gallows and the Beatles, I, I feel like there's still a bit of <laughs> a bit of a, a vulgarity kind of difference. I guess. Exactly. Well, the last question before I let you go, do you have a TV recommendation a thing that we should be watching on our television, besides the music videos uh, from the noble art of self-destruction that we should be watching. Oh man, I'm so glad you've asked this because yeah, I've been home, I've been, we've been touring extensively. And when I come home, I'm very fortunate to be in a really happy relationship. And I find some of the best moments when you're, you, you know, home with your partner and trying to make the most of time, just sitting on the couch and watching TV is just, is the best thing you know what I mean so uh we've been absolutely tanking it at the moment with tv shows um we finished succession the other week which I think is superb television uh we are in the last few episodes of death note at the moment which is one of my favorite yeah I mean anime is one of my favorite things in the world so I've managed to convince her to watch anime with me and she loves death note and the final thing we've just started watching the bear I'm not sure if you're into that yeah but yeah I'm a, I'm a TV snob though. I love cool, you know, True Detective season three, we finished the other week as well. So I love cool, you know, serious kind of like character pieces with good dialogue, you know, it's like, so, but yeah, any of those four things I tell, I tell you to check out. And if you don't like serious, cool kind of, you know, dark TV shows, I would urge anyone to watch an anime series called Spy Family. It is about, um, it's about a spy who adopts a little girl as part of his cover but it turns out she's telepathic and she can read minds. So the rest of it is just a fun, lovely, family-friendly TV show. So, yeah. Lucas, yes. you have taste whether it is on the stage, on the record, on the television. So thank you for your time. Looking forward to the next U.S. dates in New York. But uh, keep up the great work in the meantime. And really exciting to see that you finish the trilogy like this. Thank you, man. And thank you for a great interview. I don't think anybody had asked any of the questions you asked. That was a completely unique interview. So thank you very much. Outrocast. <laughs>